the great seafarers of antiquity were not the first to conquer this ocean. They were to use the stepping stones laid down before them by other travelers. This is the story of the voyagers before man, of strange journeys in a fluid realm by mysterious craft. Their destination is unknown, and their passage is set with natural nightmares that beggar description. To human eyes, their mission is impossible, and yet most of the creatures in this ocean have made the trip. And some of them have ended here. Atoll reefs span the Pacific like great cobbled roads embedded in the oceans. Born of the tempest of the ocean swells where humans cannot build, they are not of this earth in the way of rocks and soil. An atoll's cement-like mortar is made by living things, simple animals and plants, corals, algae, and myriad other creatures. The vast chains of reefs that straddle the Pacific are built by these seemingly immobile, rock-like corals. A reef is home to even more species than the great rainforests. Clustered throughout the tropics, they are the biological crown jewels of nature's biodiversity. swells shoulder and buffet the reef. Corals, the rock-like animals that are the building blocks of the reef, become compact and robust to resist the surge. Where the surf breaks, corals give way to pink rinds of stony calcareous algae that are the glue that holds the whole structure together. Eventually, storms claim some corals, plucking their skeletons from the reef they have built. Despite the hazards, life remains vigorous and abundant here. Forged in this fishy furnace, the reef prevails. Over time, it resists everything the ocean can throw at it to build a massive fortress. But the corals that succumb play another role. They gather to form rubble ramparts that backfill the seaward margins. These second-hand fortifications form an endless variety of spaces for an endless variety of species. With time and tide, this rubble is reduced to dust. Gradually, it is swept under the great turquoise carpet of the reef's lagoon. Here, sediment gathers in comparative tranquility, and so do many creatures. Mm. 
Some live on it, some within it, and some consume it with a passion. But one thing unites the tens of thousands of species that may be found here. Most of them have come from somewhere else. In every drop of water, in every sea, is plankton. A myriad of fantastic shapes and forms living their lives unseen. Down here are the plants and animals that run the great life support systems of the planet, the engines of the living Earth. These crystalline particles are plants called phytoplankton. They are small, a hundred times smaller than a pinhead, and they're responsible for over 50% of the oxygen on this planet. They are as important, if not more important, than all the forests of the land in the way they affect the air we breathe. The surface of the ocean is peppered with these incredibly small plants. Each day they gather sunlight, release oxygen, and multiply to produce food for grazers, such as copepods. A copepod is a crustacean, like a shrimp or a crab specialized to live in the plankton. It dwarfs the plants it eats. Even so, it is smaller, much smaller than a matchhead. On this planktonic prairie, a copepod is like a bison swimming in a sea of liquid grass. These and many other species are professional plankton. They are plants, grazers, and predators, just like any other ecosystem, busily living their tiny lives adrift in the high seas. But other strange entities tumble and thrash through the back blocks of oblivion. They are on a mission. They are the interstellar voyagers of inner space. is the larval form of a sea urchin. This is a coral larva on its journey to find or found a new reef. Virtually all of the familiar creatures of the sea have a larval phase in their life cycle when they become a temporary member of the plankton. of the oceans, their journey to find a new reef seems hopeless. But somehow, the creatures in this larval lottery prevail. This is the story of how simple animals and plants have crossed oceans and constructed empires. A tale of epic voyaging through the deeps of geological time. But even Jenny's end is no guarantee of success. Fusiliers dart forward of the reef to feed on incoming plankton. Their forked tails give them the speed and agility to expose themselves to open water. They are an advance guard. Behind them lies the wall of mouths that the reef presents to the sea. The most densely packed array of interconnected life on the planet. The plankton bathing the reef are the invisible life support system that underpins all this bounty. They package sparse nutrients from a bland ocean into food parcels and import them to the reef as bite-sized morsels for those with a taste for them. But even for those who don't, there are benefits. The reef community is not so much a food chain, but a food web. Imported energy spills out in every direction through a maze of interconnections. 
The tangle of relationships is so complex and ancient that many creatures seem to live cheek by jowl, oblivious to the perils they present to each other. It's the dance of life, and nowhere else is it so magnificently choreographed. As in the plankton, the roles of grazers, predators and scavengers all ultimately depend on the bottom rung of the ladder, the plants. Covering the reef's rubble pavements like a five o'clock shadow is an invisible fuzz of algae. Every day as it grows, it garners sunlight and nutrients into a nutritious turf. But as fast as it grows, it is grazed. An army of tiny mouths constantly peck, bite and scrape the algae such that its presence is almost invisible. places where the reef lets its algal hair down. Some damselfishes have become farmers. They tend the algae within their territory, protecting it from the madding crowds and picking the best of the crop for themselves. Thousands of different mouths are to be found on a reef. but only some of them graze on algae. Bleached patches in the colored carpet are unusual. A predator is at hand. The crown of thorn sea star makes a living digesting the flesh of coral. As it moves across the reef, it leaves feeding scars that reveal the coral skeleton of purest white limestone. Fishes are to be found in seemingly endless variety on a reef, their bodies having evolved to investigate every opportunity open to them. The tough stony leather of the pincushion sea star is no match for the muscled mouth of the titan triggerfish. One can be forgiven for having the impression that reef creatures spend their lives innocently going about the dance of life. But every now and then, someone commits a nasty little murder amid the coral gardens. The landscape is littered with mines and traps, and it doesn't pay to put a fin wrong. In the middle of the day, everyone seems to be on their best behavior but as the light begins to fail in the late afternoon, predators become active. It's a time of anxiety for many. As the pace of the dance speeds up. Daytime creatures are seeking shelter for the night ahead 
at the same time as the night shift is making its way out onto the reef. Few fish are active at night, most preferring to sleep in caves and crevices among the coral. Predators, such as the white-tipped shark, haunt the dreams of the sleeping reef. The firefish also stalks the lagoon floor for sleeping fish. Even if its prey is awake, the firefish's feathery aura disguises the image of impending doom at the center of all the finery. But there are other monsters in this nightmare. Some creatures have no need for light. They hunt by smell. A cone snail, a marvel of biological engineering, tastes the water for the odor of sleeping fish. Imagine something the size of a Volkswagen has emerged from the lawn outside your house. In total darkness, it sends a super sensitive fire hose-like probe through the garden in search of your scent. Coming through the window, it meanders its way towards your bed. In preparation, a harpoon the size of a fence post has been loaded at the tip and is connected to a sack of the deadliest known nerve poison. Death is swift. The cone snail returns to its lair. The reef holds out the dual prospects of shelter and terror for its inhabitants. The dance of life is choreographed around the time and the tides. Every species has its own witching hour when it becomes either the hunter or the hunted. Each role is a link in a fabric that forms the web of interactions of the reef community. In this way, the microscopic morsels of plankton and the nutrients they bring are shared around the reef. Atolls are like isolated mountains of living tissue that depend on this stream of invisible planktonic particles, hapless handouts from the high seas. But plankton provide more than an indirect meal ticket for the creatures of the reef community. They are the reef community, incognito. After drifting for an empty eternity, arrival at a reef is the final stage in a great journey of survival for a coral larva. This is how marine creatures establish themselves throughout the oceans. But before they can fulfill their destiny, they must pass one last test. This is the Wall of Mouths, a carpet of predators that smother the face of the reef, straining, sieving, and clutching the water for incoming particles. The Wall of Mouths has no conscience about whom it claims. But some larvae make it through and begin a remarkable transformation. After weeks, sometimes months as plankton, they begin to take on their adult form. This is the coral polyp at work. The lifeboat phase of its life cycle is over. Now comes the task of empire. Cloning is rare among land animals, but for those settled on the sea floor, it is the path to permanence. By making identical copies of itself, an individual polyp can grow to control the space around it as a colony. Over time, these printing press animals have come to dominate the reefscape. 
There are now empty rooms in these biological hotels, for the lodgings come with a job. Corals, more than any other creature, have used cloning to create the marvelous architecture of the reef. Tiny planktonic meals seem hardly enough to pay for all the construction we see here. Something in their ability to build the reef's stony fabric sets the corals apart from other reef creatures. And the secret to their success starts here. Eight and a half minutes from the sun at the speed of light is the planet Earth. And every day the Pacific Ocean basks. Bathed in the boundless free energy of sunlight, the reef is hard at work. The humble coral, a brainless tube with a ring of plankton stinging tentacles, is responsible for one of nature's great evolutionary achievements. The fusion of animal with plant. The coral polyp animal contains tiny plant cells dispersed through its tissue. Solar energy filters through and is captured by these plant cells. They thrive on a diet of sunlight, carbon dioxide and animal wastes. In return, the plant cells release oxygen and leak sugars. They are like land plants living inside an animal. It's the perfect recycling system that combines both plant and animal engines, giving the coral energy to burn. Energy to build. Over time, other reef organisms have discovered this strategy. Cassiopeia, the upside-down jellyfish, sits on the seafloor pointing its solar panels full of plants at the sun. So efficient is this symbiosis that it has no need to feed in a conventional way anymore. The giant clam owes its giantness to tissue loaded with the same recycling technology. But overall, it's the coral clam that has built this reef. The energy excess created by having a plant living inside an animal, combined with the ability to clone, has made them the great construction specialists of the oceans. In turn, their industry creates space for other creatures attracted to the reef's rich resource of life. In the vastness of the oceans, a reef seems to act as a biological magnet that attracts and adapts species over time. With so many species competing to live on this needle in an oceanic haystack, it's not surprising that space is scarce in this environment. Space, indeed, is everything. In the clamor to eke out a living, some species have taken to using others as real estate. The algae that drive the coral construction powerhouse are intimately woven into the very chemistry of a coral's lifestyle. They live together in a relationship called symbiosis, and for the corals, this relationship has tangible ecologic benefits. On a reef, many creatures live together, but the terms of the deal struck for shared lodging varies. We often think of species in competitive terms, survival of the fittest, but there are other ways to make a living. When creatures live together, the line between predator and prey is blurred. Some are just coming along for the ride. Creatures like the tireless burrowing shrimps seem to be almost domesticated in the service of the guardian goby. Others, however, are just plain parasites. The damselfish has nothing to gain from the liaison with this blood-sucking fish louse.
The potato cod actually encourages the attention of the parasite-removing cleaner wrasse for a mutual benefit. An anemone's stinging tentacles may be home to more than just clownfish. They may support an entire community in miniature, each member eking out a living and defending their patch of somebody else's turf. Reefs support the highest densities of species of any habitat, and this has been the case over geological chunks of time. Here, life has learned to live with itself. Creatures have become homes in their own right. And the depth of their intimacies knows no bounds. Why are there so many species here? For those creatures surrounded by empty ocean, a reef is the only game in town. And it is here, over time, that evolution has run wild. Competition and cooperation striving with equal vigor have woven a fabric in which every thread, no matter how bizarrely colored and textured, is connected. It's a tapestry of life as art. Creatures are more than just a potential meal. They have become habitat in themselves. Evolution shapes both species and their lifestyles in strange clays of cooperation. There are no rules, no bounds to nature's experiments, no fashion other than to survive. From the thin broth of the Pacific, these submarine mountains are built and maintained so long as the sun keeps shining. And over time, they draw ever closer to the surface until one day, they kiss the sky and the creatures of the air alight. by watching the passage of seasons can we see other moments in the reef's repertoire. The onset of summer in the tropics is hard to define. Sometimes it is just that part of the year when the water is a little warmer or the day a little longer. But these subtle signs gnaw at the reef's creatures and their biological clocks.
An egg-bound green turtle strains under a newfound sense of gravity to build a nest. Throughout her adult life, she will traverse tropical seas, occasionally returning here to this pile of coral sand. In this desolate ocean, without the reef and the skeletal remains of its creatures, there would be no sand, no island, no place for turtles like these. Turtles are driven to complete their biological programming, even if it kills them. The tides of nature continue to ebb and flow. Success or failure of an individual go unnoticed in the melee of the reef food web. Just as turtles are attracted to the reef to nest, so too tiger sharks are attracted to feed. The high tide brings another meal from the beach. Tiger sharks are the garbage collectors of the oceans. This female circles her prey with great caution. One doesn't get to be over three meters long by taking risks. And when you eat the dead, there's no need to be in a hurry. She approaches the turtle's carcass. Just lazily, she throws her immense weight behind massive jaws lined with serrated teeth to gouge through the turtle's protective shell. Once the soft entrails are exposed, she returns again and again to rent huge chunks of flesh. This predator, turned scavenger, helps energy to flow round and round the reef. But one day, even she will become food for something. The instinct to mate affects all creatures, and as the summer wears on, symptoms break out, altering animal behaviors everywhere. The humble flatworm is as driven to reproduce as any other species, and having found a mate, engages in a sensual wrestle of courtship. A keen eye soon sees the signs of sex woven throughout the reef's routine. An octopus slinks across the daytime reef he has found a female who is ready to mate. She lingers apprehensively. As he fends off territorial damselfish. His approach is cautious. Sex is the final fatal chapter in the short life of an octopus. Neither will see a second season. This subtle sex scene is possible 
because his sperm is stored in packets located at the tip of his third right arm. Once deposited inside her mantle, the sperm is kept to later fertilize her developing eggs. And eggs are everywhere. Clownfish mate and nest under the protective shadow of their anemone. They tend the nest closely. Eggs are expensive to make, and other fish view them as high-energy food morsels, ripe for the picking. Eggs that have been developing through the winter months are ripening in bellies all over the reef. Just where they are laid is as varied as the creatures laying them. A golden damsel guards a sea whip, frosted by her clutch of eggs. The titan triggerfish is serious about its nest. An obsession with lagoonal landscaping is characteristic of triggerfishes, and they are prepared to defend their investment. Ensuring there is another generation is a dangerous journey, and finding a mate is the first step. Mandarin fish spend most of their lives secreted under rubble, their exquisite patterning criminally hidden from view. They choose the time to mate carefully. In the growing dusk, they stir like bashful gems. A furtive courting dance soon gives way to the risk of reverie. They drift above the reef and in a flurry of fins place their bets in the lottery of life. Fish show two main strategies for the game of chance. Produce a few eggs and like the clown triggerfish look after them very well or produce countless eggs and cast them far and wide to face countless risks. It's a gamble, and nowhere is the gamble so dramatic as when a group decide to place the same bet at the same time. Unlike the secretive mandarin fish, surgeon fish use dust to break cover on an extraordinary scale. Fitfully at first, courting pairs rise to release clouds of eggs and sperm. They're soon joined by others, and a frenzy ensues. In the fading light, their sex turns the reef's crystal waters opaque with clouds of hope. For them, and millions of others, this is the beginning of the greatest journey never told. And in the growing darkness, other comrades are preparing for the trip. At the going down of this sun, something crucial has silently fallen into place. The final cog has been added to nature's invisible machinery. Immobile creatures all over the reef are stirring. To synchronize their blind date, they use the rhythm of the solar system as their timekeeper. The lengthening days of summer combined with the moon's gentle gravity, have awoken the reef. The sea cucumber, a sand-sifting denizen of the lagoon floor, stirs with passion. In this endless, maddening summer of sex, each species has a secret biological appointment known only to their own kind. This night, has woken the corals from their slumber. For 364 days of the year, they are stony-faced, and then, with little warning, they blink away their seeds. Wave upon wave, the corals spawn, every individual of each species releasing its eggs and sperm at the same time.
the bundles of eggs and sperm float to the surface where they unravel. Once fertilized, there is work to be done. In 24 hours, the fertilized egg of the developing coral has divided hundreds of times and has taken on its voyaging planular form. Silently, the coral's planula slips into the night, and only hours away, so does its nemesis, the crown of thorn sea style. As adults, they are mortal enemies, but for now, they have other tasks at hand, for they have become larval lifeboats. All through the summer, the atolls of the Pacific smolder with sexual intent. Forming a chain, they communicate by chance. The vastness of the open ocean disguises the highway of life hidden within. Each lava carries its own survival kit, tested over millions of years. They are playing in the big league. Their story is not just about the here and now. It's the ongoing struggle between life and the planet itself. They are always out there, patrolling the edge of oblivion, planktonic particles in search of a place. Their mission to find or found a new reef seems hopeless. They may drift for days, weeks, even months. The vast majority of them will perish in the more of some planktonic nightmare. But somehow, over time, some of these compassless messengers get through to deliver the future of a species from the jaws of its past. Over millennia, countless planktonic voyages are launched in a bid to conquer the oceans. It's a one-way ticket. None of them ever come back. New outposts are founded and new fortresses built, and these in turn seed even remoter frontiers. This network of oceanic stepping stones built by simple corals and algae has allowed thousands of species to explore the oceans. And humans were the last to make the trip. the Pacific. The great seafarers of antiquity were not the first to conquer this ocean. They were to use the stepping stones laid down before them by other travelers. This is the story of the voyagers before man, of strange journeys in a fluid realm by mysterious craft. Their destination is unknown, and their passage is set with natural nightmares that beggar description. To human eyes, their mission is impossible, and yet most of the creatures in this ocean have made the trip. And some of them have ended here. Atoll reefs span the Pacific like great cobbled roads embedded in the oceans. 
Born of the tempest of the ocean swells where humans cannot build, they are not of this earth in the way of rocks and soil. An atoll's cement-like mortar is made by living things, simple animals and plants, corals, algae, and myriad other creatures. The vast chains of reefs that straddle the Pacific are built by these seemingly immobile rock-like corals. A reef is home to even more species than the great rainforests. Clustered throughout the tropics, they are the biological crown jewels of nature's biodiversity. slopes, the great ocean swells shoulder and buffet the reef. Corals, the rock-like animals that are the building blocks of the reef, become compact and robust to resist the surge. Where the surf breaks, corals give way to pink rinds of stony calcareous algae that are the glue that holds the whole structure together. Eventually, storms claim some corals, plucking their skeletons from the reef they have built. Despite the hazards, life remains vigorous and abundant here. Forged in this fishy furnace, the reef prevails. Over time, it resists everything the ocean can throw at it to build a massive fortress. But the corals that succumb play another role. They gather to form rubble ramparts that backfill the seaward margins. These second-hand fortifications form an endless variety of spaces for an endless variety of species. With time and tide, this rubble is reduced to dust. Gradually, it is swept under the great turquoise carpet of the reef's lagoon. Here, sediment gathers in comparative tranquility, and so do many creatures. Some live on it, some within it, and some consume it with a passion. But one thing unites the tens of thousands of species that may be found here. Most of them have come from somewhere else. In every drop of water, in every sea, is plankton. A myriad of fantastic shapes and forms living their lives unseen. Down here are the plants and animals that run the great life support systems of the planet. 
the engines of the living Earth. These crystalline particles are plants called phytoplankton. They are small, a hundred times smaller than a pinhead, and they're responsible for over 50% of the oxygen on this planet. They are as important, if not more important, than all the forests of the land in the way they affect the air we breathe. The surface of the ocean is peppered with these incredibly small plants. Each day they gather sunlight, release oxygen, and multiply to produce food for grazers, such as copepods. A copepod is a crustacean, like a shrimp or a crab, specialized to live in the plankton. It dwarfs the plants it eats. Even so, it is smaller, much smaller than a match head. On this planktonic prairie, a copepod is like a bison swimming in a sea of liquid grass. These and many other species are professional plankton. They are plants, grazers, and predators just like any other ecosystem, busily living their tiny lives adrift in the high seas. But other strange entities tumble and thrash through the back blocks of oblivion. They are on a mission. They are the interstellar voyagers of inner space. This is the larval form of a sea urchin. This is a coral larva on its journey to find or found a new reef. Virtually all of the familiar creatures of the sea have a larval phase in their life cycle when they become a temporary member of the plankton. In the vastness of the oceans, their journey to find a new reef seems hopeless. But somehow, the creatures in this larval lottery prevail. This is the story of how simple animals and plants have crossed oceans and constructed empires. A tale of epic voyaging through the deeps of geological time. But even Jenny's end is no guarantee of success. Fusiliers dart forward of the reef to feed on incoming plankton. Their forked tails give them the speed and agility to expose themselves to open water. They are an advance guard. Behind them lies the wall of mouths that the reef presents to the sea. The most densely packed array of interconnected life on the planet. The plankton bathing the reef are the invisible life support system that underpins all this 